This is the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast, brought to you by Cisco. Cisco is here to help set you up for success by delivering high-quality foods, products, and services for your restaurant. Recording live to digital from the NC F&B studios in downtown Raleigh. Join us as we lead you into the kitchen, inside the bottle, and into the minds of the food and beverage industry. And now, having their lunch at the Costco Sample Kiosk, it's Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And today, I want you to sit down, cut yourself a slice of pie, and enjoy it with the owner and head of Slice Pie Company, Kristen Mullins. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's very nice to have you in in studio. And uh, guess what, everybody? She brought pie. She brought pie. <laughs> I don't even know the cameras. You probably yeah, won't. Yeah. Be careful. There I'm going to like drop go. it all on the floor. But uh, for those that are not watching, how dare you? We do have a YouTube page where you can see our beautiful faces. This is where we need to sometimes go live. Because people would be like clamoring the place right now. Just if they saw that live, they'd just be like, oh, shoot, I gotta go get that. Oh, like right outside, sorry, but yeah. right outside the uh, the window. Like, uh, yeah, they're outside of the corner of Fayetteville and Hargett in downtown Raleigh. No, if they were watching live, they would go directly to Slice Pie Company and exactly. grab themselves some pies. Exactly. Oh, if you're seeing that. And okay. you can do that. So even yeah. better. Exactly. Yeah. And you're. You're close. You're you're you used yeah. to be extremely close. You used, used to be walkable, but now yes. you're just like a little bit down the road. Yes. Yeah. So originally we were on Martin Street and it was just a pop-up shop that was only going to last for roughly 6 months. We were just testing it out and then next thing I know we were there for almost 2 years. Yeah, um, it didn't didn't feel like a pop-up to me. Yeah. I was like, no, they're that's no, they're here because we were killing it. And I was like, we are going to stay as long as they will let us. And no <laughs> production was there. So yeah. production was always somewhere else. So that it was a safe bet for me to just kind of stay as long as I could. Yeah. Um, and but now we're just up the street with production and everything all in one spot. So total game changer, but yeah. Yeah. overhead changer as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I went there. I, I took the family, uh, my daughters and my wife, to sl- the Slice Pie uh, Company, which is, so you're on so- uh, South Saunders, right? Yes. South Saunders. Mm-hmm. And who knew that this area is like turning into a really cool location? Yeah. Like, it's, it's, uh, you can miss it if you don't If you're not looking for it, Um, but once our customer base has kind of like figured it out, we're right off Highway 40. We're, I mean, we're literally just off Highway 40 with our own parking, so it's super easy. You can park on the side of the street as well. Um, But until people like realize how easy it is to get in out of, they're a little bit like, oh, you know, I got to go into downtown Raleigh. But then as soon as they come, they're like, oh, this is super easy. You know what gets people? It's because if you're coming, if you're heading. Uh, what is it? East into Raleigh, you have to make the U-turn. Yes. So people get really confused by yes. the U-turns and roundabouts. It's, you know, very, very American true. culture for whatever reason. But yeah, you're right there near Earp's Seafood, yes. right? Where yeah. a lot of people right know. Right next door to Riparian. And Riparian, which, uh, by the way, I didn't know about until we had a kegged wine seminar. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and they do a lot of wines on tap. And and uh, so they ho- they were kind enough to host for us. And what a cool spot that is as well. Yeah. Pies and pints. Yeah. When I try to trademark that, but somebody else already did. Uh, (laughs) What about pints and pies? You know, I was wondering if I could just switch it, but I think, I don't know. We'll see. I'll have to look into that again. But now somebody else already is. So it's no bubbles and brisket. Come on. Let's be honest, folks. (laughs) Oh, that sounds delicious. It it is delicious. Yeah. Um, well, as long as we're talking about that, you know, we don't have a dessert vendor mm-hmm. as of yet. Hmm, I know someone. Mm. Yeah, we're definitely gonna <laughs> we're definitely gonna uh, tap on uh, Andia. Yeah, she'll have to her return. Ice cream oh, is tremendous. The best. Yeah, and we're Imagine gonna a, guilt a her. Scoop of Andia's. Oh, them. you have already. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So for those that don't know what we're talking yeah. about, and how dare you? Because <laughs> you should be listening every week. Um, it's but, the fourth year, people. Yeah, it's the fourth year. We're gonna do bubbles and brisket on June. 
June 1st at Smoky Hollow in downtown Raleigh, like we've done for the last two years. And uh, I know that's confusing, but the first year we did it in Cary uh, at a pop-up at V Pizza. Um, but uh, June 1st, you can get your tickets soon. Not yet. believe we're going to sell tickets in the middle of April, so stay tuned. But right now, we are building the event, meaning we're getting our vendors. Like, sounds like we're going to have some pie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, And maybe some ice cream. But we also are going to have some amazing chefs that will be on board. Some extremely awesome wine, which Matt and I, we're going to talk wine in a little bit more on that. Um, But But it's going to be a fun event. Max, you know, in that, what if you're just like so amped for bubbles and brisket and you can't wait till June. Like you're just so like, I need my bubbles fix. Like what? Yeah. And maybe it's like early in the, in the day, like it's a brunch or something. Oh. And you wanted something mm. to eat. Like, like a bagel, <laughs> like <laughs> bubbles and, and bagels. <laughs> yeah. So we're doing bubbles and bagels before in Holly Springs, in my neck of the woods at uh, this, awesome new wine shop called Wine 100, and uh, Christy Griffith, chef extraordinaire from mm. Pimento Tea Room, she, um, I do a supper club there every, every, and you guys would be, wow, you guys would be, you, you guys need yes, to know each other. <laughs> um, she does, her flavor combinations are wild and fascinating and fantastic, and so she made bagels recently for a supper club that I did where I pair all the wines, and I just said, uh, we talk bagels all the time, and I said, you're going to need to make these for an event because they're really damn good. So she's going to make yeah. an array of bagels and all the accoutrements, of gravlocks, cream cheese, mm. capers, oh, the whole yeah. thing. Uh, and we're going to pair it with bubbles from from Wine Bow and Wine 100. Yeah, what, it, say, what sounds better than delicious champagne and sparkling, just all of them, and bagels and a little cream cheese schmear? You know, um, you know it's funny, Matt. Uh, Maybe it's the one percent Jewish that I have in my in my blood. I thought it was fourteen <laughs> percent. Oh, it's my my mom. Oddly enough, has fourteen percent. Yeah. But then when I looked on ancestry dot com, you know, we recently discussed this how my father's family's from Buncombe County originally. Yeah. Um, I only have one percent Jewish hmm. blood in like on my direct link, hmm. but my mom has fourteen, and I'm like, why? Why are you holding all that back? How did that get all washed out? You would think you would at least gotten seven percent of it. Yeah, I don't know, but um, but anyhow, I think that one percent came through to my eldest daughter Alexandra because her fourteenth birthday was this weekend, and she said, "Dad, there's one thing that I want to eat more than anything," and I'm like, "What?" And she showed me a picture of like something she saw on Instagram. She wanted bagels with gravlax and cream cheese with the capers and all that. Hmm. So I went to New York Deli, which is an amazing, cool deli up yeah. in the North Raleigh. Huge line, by the way, like line out the door. So good. But it's it's tremendous. Mm-hmm. If you don't know, well, everyone knows because the line's out the door, so they no. all know. Every bagel place in the Raleigh area on a Saturday and Sunday morning has lines out yes, the door. Yes, very true. True. Okay. That, that's Born a good and raised, thing. I can. Yes. Yeah, that's true. That. So we're going to do this. But yeah, check your calendars. April 14th. Mm-hmm. At Wine 100 in Holly Springs, Mm -hmm. bagels, bubbles and bagels, everybody. Get to it. Uh, Tickets tickets on sale. Yeah. Uh, I guess we're putting tickets on sale maybe this week. I don't know. We'll we'll figure it out. (laughs) This is how organized we are, everybody. (laughs) This is the entrepreneurial winget scenario. Yeah. Uh, But no, we have Tickets are on sale. Tickets will be on sale. You'll see a price, the whole thing. Bubbles and bagels, April 14th. See it in Holly Springs. All right. Let's now get into some pie over here. Yes. You did, for one, bring us two pies. And I. there's no way we're going to delve into these things and like make a huge mess because Matt and I have children. So we're going to slice these pies up. We're yeah. gonna I know. Take I feel home. a little guilty. I didn't bring you our little half pie containers because we can cut pies in half. But the meringue would not have yeah, cut no, well. No guilt. <laughs> and, That's uh, 1%. Uh, of Max's <laughs> Jewish guilt that you're getting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you uh, you only brought us two pies. I know. Sorry, I could have done better. Apparently, you, you couldn't have brought more pies, huh? No, I mean, brought... I could have, but I stopped there. How many pies do you make? Like, how many different combina- oh, flavor combinations? Um, I think. Well, on the menu, mm-hmm. um, you can pre-order online, and we have like twenty to twenty-two flavors. But I can make anything. So, like, if you, you know, like our egg custard pie we made this morning, for instance, is not on my regular menu, but somebody pre-ordered it um, to come in and get. So we can do anything. It's just we don't want to have everything yeah, online. Of course. Um, but if you called me and you're like, my grandmother makes it, the only thing that we will not bend on is our crust. 
So if you ask me to do a graham cracker crust, I we just don't do it. We you stay, don't do it. We stay very close to. That's where you draw our, the line. Yeah, the even on the key lime, you won't do the graham cracker. I will not. All right. But I, I, I just, swear to you, I had you, the key lime. It was delicious. Thank you. I, I swear to you. I feel like the difference. Um, I actually am not a huge sweet person which is surprising to many <laughs> let's yeah. create a business ha- set right. around sugar oh. but the reason i love our pies so much is because our crust is not overly sweet to me i mm-hmm. prefer something with a little bit of salty texture like flavor um to it and so our crust a lot of times reminds people of like a flaky biscuit and then you mix that with something sweet to me i could eat our a slice of pie like every single day mm. but if you put a cupcake or a slice of cake in front of me it's too sweet for me there's too much much sugar yeah, in it yeah and i always tell people if you try our pie and you feel like it's overly sweet then it's wrong so <laughs> something happened something yeah. yeah on that note do you make a savory do you make any savory pies <sighs> i this is this a is bone a of contention pie. here this is a loaded a, question a minced meat m- i pie? have mm. an incredible line of savory okay oh that i would love to launch but as you know that requires health code, a totally different kitchen. And so if given the opportunity, we are very open to that. And I have a killer line, but I'm fully aware Mm. that like, I will need some hands involved in that. Mm -hmm. So I'm open to it. I know that Raleigh needs it. Yeah. Um, What's like, uh, give us like maybe like two or three Names of recipe, not like you know, styles of, of meat pies that you would do. Well, a chicken pot pie, obviously. Obviously, yeah. um, shepherd's pie. Mm-hmm. Um, oh my gosh, shepherd's uh, pie is like where they cover it with mashed potatoes, right? Yeah, they, I mean, we can, making it. any of the pies. I mean, any category of pie. My dad has like, he already has stuff ready to go. Yeah. He would like before we turn it into a full fledged business, he would make little pot pies and like give to people all the time chicken pot pies yeah um but it just now that i'm doing full retail for the first time in the last three years it's there's so much to it people don't consider and you never want to be like well you just don't understand (laughs) it's true though like you really do that's where you tell people on this podcast is here's what you don't understand in the most respectful way change the whole dynamic of the business and um this space we've been in for almost three years now has been like the biggest life lesson I could have ever imagined. And I'm so glad that I didn't come out with both at once mm. Yeah, because I cannot tell you how much I've grown and changed and learned in just three years about full blown retail. It's a whole nother beast than what we were experienced before, which was more wholesale. So Anyways, at, at some point in time, I would love to add savory because I know we would kill it. Would but... you have to change the crust? No. Oh, okay. All right. No. Well, I want to know, we, we haven't even really talked about your business and why it's called the Slice Pie Company yeah. and all that. I want to know why it's called that, why it's like uh, akin to like a New York pizzeria in some in some yeah. way, Matt. Yeah. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to um, talk... Give a, a, a quick shout out to our sponsor, Cisco. Yes, yeah, Cisco isn't just our partner. They also partner with more local ranchers, growers, and producers, pie makers perhaps, than any other distributor in the industry. That's why their commitment to community is unmatched. Yeah, it isn't enough for them to just be the global leader in food service. Cisco's mission also has heart, a heart for food, a heart for service, and a heart for community. How do they follow through? supporting farm-to-table initiatives to deliver the very best local products, partnering with food banks and nonprofits to help underserved communities around the world and here at home, fighting hunger, because isn't that what food service is all about? Yeah, visit Cisco, that's S-Y-S-C-O dot com, to learn more about their heartfelt commitment to community. Cisco, at the heart of food and service. All right. Well, let's take a quick moment to say hello to our friend Lane out there in Carborough, because what better thing to pair all of this delicious pie than with some uh, coffee? Hello, Lane. Hello. How are y'all doing today? We're great. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. great. Um, so I my my mouth is watering talking about apple pies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> especially those made with gala apples. And it was so um, interesting that today um, I, I chose to brew a coffee from one of our female producers um, in Peru. Her name is Edith Meza. Yeah. Um, and um, she's from the uh, Satipito uh, uh, region of Peru, which is really deep in the rainforest. In fact, most of her farm is is um, protected rainforest, which is pretty, pretty cool. And um, so uh, she inherited this farm in 2007 after her mom passed away. And we met her in 2013 at a barista competition in Peru. <laughs> and we're really very surprised Um by um, the um, talent that she had for processing her coffee. And so she's specializing, most coffee in Peru is wash coffee simply because it's um, very um, uh, humid in Peru, especially up in the mountains. But she's specializing in some naturals and some honey processed coffee, including the one that um, we're drinking today. Um, so her farm is named uh, Finca Tasta, which um, loosely translated is um, flavor farm. Uh, and I think this truly is a, a flavor uh, farm uh, coffee. So it's a, um, a honey uh, katura, a honey katai, and it has really um, wonderful flavors of caramel, um, some crisp gala apples in it. Um, it has some lush melon acidity in it. Um, the thing about this coffee mm. that I really like, and especially all um, all of her coffees is they have a really beautiful caramely aftertaste that stays in your mouth and it gets better and better. So um, at the at the very end of the uh, of the tasting, you'll you'll have some apples and some baked peaches and some caramel. Um, and it's super sweet and super delicious. Forget about flavor town. Take me to the flavor farm. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, Thanks again, Lane. Make sure that everyone, if you're interested in getting this coffee from Carboro, go to carborocoffee.com to find out everything that they're doing. You can even check on their website. They've got the uh, link to our video that uh, that we uh, did over the summer with, uh, with Scott and Lane. And uh, check them out. Go get yourself some coffee. And Lane, we will uh, we'll hear from you next week. Okay. Don't eat all the pie. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. So... The Slice Pie Company. It's called that because you can buy a slice of pie. Yes? Yes, you can <laughs> now, but you couldn't originally. Um, I don't know. It was. It hit me out of nowhere that I had to do this, and it was the very first name that came to me, and I never budged. Mm. Yeah, okay, so hit. originally you just were buying whole pies, even though it was called slice pie. So originally I was selling them as whole pies. Okay. And then we started to sell them more. Well, okay. Originally, yes, that's how it started. Because you were also wholesale. Yes. And we were selling to restaurants and markets. Mm. Then I started selling us slices as we were growing the business. But when I started the business, I remember I cutting a slice of pie and it was just immediate for me. And because I grew up here and I didn't grow up where everyone else calls like pie is pizza or whatever it is. Like it was just, yeah. it all just made sense to me. But in the beginning, it was kind of funny because I really was not even selling them by the slice. <laughs> so I could see why it was confusing. But here sure. we are today. Yeah. And, you know, now it, it doesn't makes always sense. have to make exact sense. Yeah, right. It just did in my brain. And yeah. I literally was like, why did nobody trademark this? Like, I'm not some business guru. Somebody clearly trademarked this and no one did. So mm. I was like, then I'm not budging. This is exactly what the name's going to be. And it just has stuck ever since. Well, but it, it was a really cool idea, especially with like, like specifically when you were here downtown. And I assume this, like, it was like the pandemic that kind of led to like the yes. end of that mm -hmm. particular spot. The only reason. Yeah. Cause yeah. you were crushing it. I was crushing it. It does serve, uh, you know, you're not saying, but I'll say it. Anybody got some extra cash you want to fund uh, to open up a place? Yes. Uh, these pies are awesome. I'm sure Thank that you. with some funding, you could probably put these slice pie companies all over the place. But the idea was like, you just walk by in like a dense populated downtown area, no one's going to just buy a whole pie right. for the afternoon, but you certainly would buy a slice of pie if you're just like, mm, I want that, I want that sweet urge, yeah. you know, just something to finish and a good thing to like, just show up at like a business meeting. You're like, Hey everybody, here's a couple slices of pie. Mm -hmm. Like, why not? It's like fun. What? There's a movie and I can't remember, but the guy's talking about like asking out a girl and somebody like a mentor. It's like a goodwill hunting is like, just, 
ask her if she likes pie. And he's like, pie? Why would I ask her to like pie? Just oh, like, yeah. You just ask her out for a... What is that for a slice of pie? Someone's listening right now and they know exactly yes. what we're talking about. But yeah, <laughs> ask her out for a slice of pie. Yeah, just go for a slice. And then he's like, uh, do you like pie? And yeah. Go and, get pie. And he said, why is it? Because it's just as arbitrary as asking her for um, for a coffee. It is it is wood, goodwill hunting, isn't it? Maybe. I love I that movie, so. so I feel like I should know, but I, I'm yeah. not catching. We got to find that. Well, How do you like them gala apples <laughs> right? that you put in your pie? So we discussed this right before, and yeah. uh, and Lane mentioned it uh, in the uh, in the Carborough break, but uh, specifically with your apple pie, you, you like went against the grain. You're using gala, which I guess I didn't – I'm not a pie guy, so I didn't know that like yeah. – Gala was a no no. Was it, why would gala be a no no by traditional standards? I don't know. I just know that this recipe started with like my great great grandmother who taught my father. I mean, we even make our crust complete. If you read how to make crust, we do the exact opposite. <laughs> so like, <laughs> well, there really well, is get, no get t- into that. Like, yeah. what does that mean? I mean, I, you don't want to give trade secrets, I yeah. assume. But like, what's how something that we're not us? supposed to do? Well. Surprisingly, my crust is vegan. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Also, there's this huge rule that every baker will tell you is that you're supposed to let it chill for at least 30 minutes before you use it. And we don't do that either. So there's no butter. There's no lard. There's no oh, wow. egg. So wait, um, like the, ve- the, the apple pie is vegan the apple all the way through? apple pie is vegan. Oh, you hear that, Mike? So that's, <laughs> an- that's another thing, too, that I've struggled with because – we won first place at the state fair with our apple pie. That's how I came up with the entire business. That's crazy. The there's enti- no butter. There's no lard. No. It's light and sugar. And you would swear there is. Yeah. But it's difficult to market that without turning people away. Right. Because yeah. people will be like, ew, vegan. Yeah. And then the vegan community is like, yay, yay, yay. Mm-hmm. That's, there's no way I don't believe it. But it's true. But you, as a non-vegan, would try and swear there is, and yeah. there's not. Yeah. yeah. I, I, look, for all the fat boys that watch, <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. Uh, I'm glad you told me after. Yeah. That's the whole point, because right? Because you would have, yeah. it probably would have changed changed your perspective yes. too initially. Yes. And that's why I have such a struggle with my marketing tactics with it, because I don't want to deter anyone from trying it. But once they try it, they'll be like, I would have never in a Wait million a minute. years. I yes. got it. I got it. Yes. And not to be crass, but yes. everyone that is of my age remembers <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds. Do you remember uh, when they had the big festival and um, the pie eating contest? Yes. Or, yeah. or yes. what's the end of the, at the end of the pies? Yeah. Do you remember what was at the end of the pie in the pie eating contest? It was a nudie shot of one of the girls. I've watched all of them, but right. now I'm forgetting. But yeah, yeah, so like, yeah, yeah. like the the main girl in the show, they somebody cut like that out. When well, I was it's watching it. super wrong. Like you could. <laughs> They illegally took a picture of this girl naked and then printed it on the bottom of the pie oh, container. Oh, I'll have to watch this So that, again. like, everyone, there's a line around the corner for this pie, and, it, like, Stan Gable, the, the the cool guy, Ten McGinley, is like, why is everyone eating all these nerds' pies? And he's like, well, he's like, go get one, Ogre, go get one. Yeah. And then Ogre gets one. He's, <laughs> like, he's like, how is it? He's like, it's good. He's like, is it good or is it great? He's like, it's good. And he's like, well, why is everyone eating this so much? Uh, side note, why do I know this so well? I don't know, but you do. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> I, I I this. You came really prepared today for Y'all this. Y'all now <laughs> recited like two different movies. Sadly, no, like, this is just imprinted into my brain. But Ogre is like, he's like, hmm, he's like, what, is it good or great? He's like, it's good. He's like, why is everyone eating these pies? He's like, oh, that's why. And they're like, what? <laughs> and he's like, oh, and he like wipes the whipped cream off and he shows him and then Stan's like, it's Stan's that's, girlfriend. That's my pie. I need to watch this. <laughs> I need to watch it again. Says. I've forgotten about that movie. So. Or that whole- but my point to this is the marketing of it is at the bottom of the pie pan, just put, surprise, it's vegan, <laughs> and just put it there because you wouldn't oh, care. Yeah. I was, thought you were going to say a nude picture or something. I mean, that would probably work too. But then <laughs> Don't again, they, be you know, crass. <laughs> I mean, this is a professional we show. We actually might be onto something with this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the caption would be over the you yeah. know the yeah. main. The I'm main glad shot. you said that yeah. first uh, on the pie commercial. I get it. But but oh, no. But do like, you know how many pie puns there are oh. as the pie lady? Oh, I bet. Oh, I bet. Well, and we're getting ready for Pie Day, right? We are three point one four. Yeah, uh, I I I know the the 
pi, like we're talking about pi, numbers pi, everybody's circumference ratio. Yes. Numbers. Yeah. Mathematicians. Uh, I know it, not because I'm smart at all, and I definitely don't know math, but I did some stupid um, uh, video in, in high school, my friends and I, like for um, for drama class, and we did a spoof on James Bond, mm-hmm. but instead of it being Agent 007, it was Agent 3.14159265454, and the joke was that we kept learning it so that as the agent, he's like a buffoon, as he was saying his name, everybody would always cut him off, like, because it was yeah. taking too long, but we had to know. Do you know it? That's all I know. I, I okay. know 3.14159265454, and then I'm done. But, like, that was enough for us to, like, keep saying it so that the person he was talking to would go, anyways, and then cut him <laughs> off and then get on with the story. But that was, like, our dumb joke. Yeah. As you can see, it didn't go anywhere. No, it's okay. But uh, but, <laughs> but I, I like that. So, so Pi Day is yeah. coming. It's uh, March 14th. And it's also our 10-year anniversary this year, so... We're celebrating wow. all year, but um, what is yeah. that going to look like? What, yeah. are, what are you going to do for your anniversary? Um, well, we're kind of like are in the middle of it happening, but three point one four we feel like is like obvious the obvious date to celebrate. Sure. So right now we are in the process of potentially doing something, like I said, with pies and pints mm, um okay. but pie day ends up being a huge day for us and like people who haven't been there before you can literally just walk in and grab a slice you can grab a whole pie half pie um so we'll have a ton of stuff i'm doing a ton of catering that day mm. um so corporate people love pie day yeah i was talking with uh, the woman that was working that day uh alexa oh uh, anna ray maybe anna, or diane anna or okay um and she mentioned that you do a ton of catering. Like you, yeah. you guys sell a lot of pies off site and it's, and I ship nationwide too. Yeah. yeah. Are you on good belly? Gold or, belly. Gold belly. Mm-hmm. Gold belly. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Uh, gold belly is super fun. Like you can get like Franklin's brisket barbecue oh, yeah. delivered to your house from Texas or, or so. a whole pie or a whole pie. <laughs> Even better. Yeah. Um, okay. But we're talking about this and we're talking about pie day, which is coming up, but Kristen, what, what makes you qualified to be this pie expert? Yeah. Um, I wasn't when I started. Okay. I winged it like we discussed yeah. earlier. I made everyone believe I did I was a pie expert, but yeah. I learned along the way. My dad, I grew up watching my father bake. I was the youngest of four. So I, of course, was always taken care of. Everybody, mm. you know what I'm, the youngest of four, I mean, let's be honest, like everyone at that point is just like, we'll do it for you. Yeah. So I, I did grow up kind of watching. Yeah. And then my dad made homemade bread, homemade biscuits, pie, and he even entered both biscuits and apple, his apple pie in the state fair and won both. Wow. Um, the well, year was he, he did it. Well, did he do that professionally or he, no? Okay, so he it's has his own. Yeah, he just. I mean, it literally. You did not wake up on Saturday morning without waffles. Like everything Damn. was made from scratch. Like so, I grew up around it. But it wasn't until my daughter Eliana was like two years old, and I started. I, I, I had made them with someone before, but this year I decided I was going to do it on my own, Mm -hmm. and it was painful. (laughs) And I was on the phone with my father every five seconds, but I learned a lot, and then I started to give them out as gifts for Christmas, holidays, whatever, and then the next year I realized, or throughout the year, I realized how many people in the neighborhood were talking about these pies, and like everyone was like, am I going to get on the list this year? And I was like, (laughs) oh God, this is so hard to do. Wow. And then I started to grow like a passion for it, but I had a perfectly comfortable corporate work from home job. Um... But I had never found passion for anything in my life until I had my daughter. She's two years old. I start making these pies. And next thing I know, I just cannot put the idea down. Like, Mm. I'm obsessing over it. And it just all kind of hit me at once. And I could just see, like, my future happening before my eyes in a way that I've never experienced. Love that. Um, And I also know that I was half-assing life. (laughs) And so when I had my daughter, I could not imagine spending her entire life telling her to follow her passion and do something she loves and turn it into career if I was half doing my own. Yeah. Practice what you preach. Yeah. I I mean, I truly, truly 
changed once I had her. And then when I started to bake the pies, it wasn't that I loved baking the pies, but I loved all of it. I loved the sales part of it. I love telling the story. I love the recipes behind it. Hearing my father, I almost wish he was here because you could you could get lost in his story for like all day. Yeah. Um, but I grew to love baking pies, and now I'm absolutely an expert on it. Um, but here we are, you know, 10 years later, but that's kind of like – how it all happened. I never want to like act like, oh, well, I went to culinary school, pastry chef, but I truly do love it now. I mean, clearly you can see when you look at the curls mm-hmm. in that, like that has been one of the scariest things for me to <laughs> to do. I actually waited to make meringue longer than any other pie that we make because I it it always felt inauthentic because my dad nails it. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's one of my favorite pies to make, and I do love making it. So look at this, everybody! <laughs> you're missing out if you're not watching this, but it's on a YouTube page. But look, I mean, this meringue is insane. Thank you. Yeah. Kind of looks like my hair when I wake up, right? <laughs> yeah. But now I'd say I'm an expert in yeah. many things, but then nothing. I don't know. You know, as an entrepreneur, it's like we're never fully like I, you. Kind of have to. Pretend you're good at everything, and yeah. then just learn along the way. And then, and then you get kicked in the head by COVID, and have to kind of pivot yeah. a million times from that as well. Pivoting yeah. is the best way to describe anything that we've experienced in the last several years. So. Yeah, but you, yeah, so you were open prior to it, and you were doing well. So this wasn't this wasn't a COVID project where you're like, I'm bored and I want to do this. This no, is like, no, no, no. You this were already full fledged. I was full fledged killing it. Yeah. Like my, I had never even pulled a loan for my business. Like mm. we hit the ground running. Did COVID have a positive or negative effect on your bottom line? I never had to shut the door. We never had to close down for anything, but I didn't have the overhead. Um, at the time when the, when the world started opening up yeah, is when I signed that lease, people were still kind of like unsure they were a little bit like, I don't know if I really want to go there yet. Like people were still wearing the yeah. masks and all that stuff, so it was a little bit. Were uh, you were you not producing pies at, for a moment, like during no, that time? We were killing it. I, you were always selling. Yeah, I was hand delivering sixty pies to a neighborhood at a time. Whoa! And I was taking individual orders and driving to a neighborhood in like Wake Forest. And hand delivering a pie to like each neighbor. Wow. Like we had, I never shut the doors. Like mm. we were still doing really well financially. Everything I was shipping nation, or well, we were shipping nationwide, but I don't think we were fully into Gold Belly at that point. But I, all my wholesale was still going. Yeah. Um, and then people were picking up too still um obviously the shop on martin street was no longer but i've been very fortunate to have people who just really want to support what we're doing so they were coming to us um even though it wasn't a retail um but we were good we were doing really good and then we got this space on south saunders and you know (laughs) it's a lot (laughs) Yeah. yeah because then you also have to figure out the whole front of house gig, right? Like serving people, having, I, I'm assuming you have coffee options or drink options as we well. We don't. It's more of a to go. I mean, you can okay. grab and go. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> but you have plans to do more with that. Yes. We've kind of talked like you have these ideas. You want to make this business. A I've little never bit more. been, ho- I've never been knocked down so hard in my life. I had no idea what I was doing <clears> in that space. And then processes had to be created. And, when you realize like your overhead just went from like super um negligible to significant. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no way to step away from it. Um, I at that point was able to get out of the kitchen more. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when we moved into that space, I had to roll my sleeves up and I've had my head down in the production side for the last three years. But now we've nailed it in a way that we're never panicked Mm -hmm. and we're constantly ahead, but it has taken a lot of time to get there. So now I feel like going into 
this year, I feel really confident stepping away and doing what I actually love the most, which is like this kind of stuff, like talking about the, yeah, the outreach. I think in a way too, because I was pulled into production so much, people kind of forgot that we needed them too. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm realizing that I've, I've also been really good at creating like, um, I don't know, just like a perception that the reputation, the consistency has always been a hundred percent. Yeah. And but I it's time for me to start talking about it again. Yeah. How many people do you employ? Right now we have about five, but it you'd be surprised. Like I can literally make a few hundred pies with just Diane today in the kitchen. Yeah. Mm, Because you have it so dialed in. It is so dialed in. And we are still hand doing everything. Like I don't have machinery that is like pressing the crust. But before I came here, I probably made like at least 50 bottom crusts. Wow. Um, And then we started like a batch of what will be like 20 coconut cream. Like I've already like my whole morning has already been super efficient. That coconut cream, like. It's tremendous. Like, Thank you. Yeah, we, we I have don't, quite a bit of pie. So I don't there. even like coconut yeah. flavored anything. And I will devour that pie. Yeah. Oh. And I think it's because people have asked me why. And I'm like, I think it's because most people are using artificial flavoring, flavoring for their coconut or sure. something. Yeah. I don't know because we're using fresh coconut flakes and then we're baking coconut flakes on the top. That'd be a that'd be a good test because Sarah does not like coconut. My wife, I do not, and, and I uh, love it. And I'd like to see if she. And that leads me to another question that I always have to ask: uh, gluten free. I guess that we can does, do that. You can do mm-hmm. gluten free, so yes. it doesn't change the pie crust. It does, but you're but you can execute it yes. in a way that you're. We pleased use with. it. It is an entirely different process. Okay, but yes, we can and we do, and we have a huge following for that. Amazing. It's just most people. Like, I don't sell a lot of slices of gluten-free in the shop, but I sell a lot of whole pies. Sure, sure. Um, For some reason, the slices, I don't know if it's because people just assume we don't. Um, Because you don't don't want to advertise. It's like, this is the prime example of what you were saying about the vegan thing, and I think the same goes for gluten-free. It is. For whatever reason, I was, uh, my wife was traveling, and I was on single dad duty, and both my kids were like, we want to make muffins, and I want to make a cake, or whatever. I'm like... Okay. And I, I'm not like a baker or anything, but I know how to put a box recipe together. Right. Like I could, I could do that. And so we're going to have a camera on that. Yeah. (laughs) It would have been funny. But so we're going through the aisles and like picking out and, and my young son picks out, we, they, for some, whatever reason he wanted cinnamon muffins. And then Cam is a little bit more like, he'll really look at his options and see what's available. And I was like, well, what if we made something that was gluten free? So mom could have it, you know, otherwise it'll get, go to waste. And, and like, I could see his face and just be like, uh, gluten free. Like, but if I didn't mention it, if I just grabbed the box right. that was gluten free sure. and it was a chocolate cake, he probably would not have known the difference. Yeah. But just that thought of it, eh, I'm not going to grab the gluten free. So I that's probably that. the same way how people think. Yeah, no, I totally get that. And like, I will say though, I, I, there's no reason for me to be gluten free and I would eat a slice of gluten free pie that we make. Yeah. It's yeah. good. Just, yeah. By the way, don't sleep on the, uh, the Dolly Parton, uh, is it Betty Crocker that does a dolly? Have you seen these in the stores? Like she has her own line of, of like instant cake mix. The Who Dolly does? Parton ones? Dolly Parton. Yeah. Oh. Are they, is it good? It's like, I think it's, it's like doll. It's like Betty Crocker's Dolly Parton. It's like, I don't think it's Dolly Parton's individual brand, Oh, but, but it's, it's like a her style. Of Betty Crocker. Yeah. And, um, she does like, uh, brownies and cakes and whatever, but it's got Dolly's logo on the side. Oh, I, I, I would and, think you would look down on those, uh, box cake what? recipes <laughs> no well you for mess. one i look up to dolly parton i yeah. love dolly parton and so <laughs> my whole family like we're all huge dolly fans mm-hmm. so that's kind of how it, it came to be but uh like i think i was just with the kids <laughs> down the aisle they're like yeah yeah dolly parton has her own cakes and i'm like well we gotta get it and so, so we did it but this is neither here nor oh, so th- anyway they were good they're delicious okay yeah. just speaking of dolly parton I, another sh- story i have to share uh you know she has this book things that she gives she has this whole thing where uh she gives kids books right kids books and so we have you know so many books at the house where it's always dolly parton at the end 
And so for whatever reason, this has started to irk him. He's like, why is Dolly Parton always at the end of the book? <laughs> <laughs> and so now my youngest one will always chide him. And when we get to the end of the book, he'll be like, Cam, look, there's Dolly Parton. There's, oh, Dolly again. So now imagine if we get the Dolly Parton cake mix. That oh, would really man. like put his head on fire. <laughs> you, ever, you ever see that? It's It makes me laugh. But on TikTok, there's like a video of a guy looking at a picture of Dolly Parton from the 70s. And she's just looking smoking hot and i mean she's beautiful and the guy goes uh if this is what dolly parton looked like in the 70s what did jolene look like (laughs) (laughs) he's like if she's feeling inferior right now like right uh send me a picture of jolene (laughs) put it at the bottom of the pie um (laughs) right clever thank you (laughs) all right um, I want to take it back to that moment, though, because I, I love those inspiration stories where you're like, yeah. you saw your whole future. What was the first thing you did after you had that feeling of inspiration? My best friend, um, Jennifer Wagner, is a... Uh, well, Jay not, Wags? Yeah, Jay Wags. She's a graphic designer. <laughs> She's actually an entrepreneur in general, but she, graphic designer, the first thing I did was tell her to help me build, like, a brand. Like so you made logo. a call, like, how do I do this? Yeah. Um, and then I went to my father and I was like, I had this idea. You're going to think I'm crazy, but I, I literally, I, I have to do this. And I can only do this if you will say yes. And he's like, you know, I tell him the whole idea. And I'm like, but I know I can sell this to anyone. Yeah. I feel that confident. But I cannot bake every day and sell it. And the very first thing I did was convince him. And he was like, I will bake it if you will sell it. Amazing. And he did not hesitate. And that was like, when I got the validation from him, I knew I had to do it at at any cost. And my father and my mother have been like my biggest supporters. Like they dropped everything for this dream um they let me take over half of their house i mean we had a detached garage apartment that we converted into a commercial kitchen and it was just i mean it's a it was very invasive for a while so for them to be willing to listen to this crazy dream and have no experience in anything that i was saying i was gonna do and they believed me like in you hindsight had conviction. I, you know <laughs> I clearly must because even 10 years later, I'm like, I am like slightly crazy. But the the fact that they believed in me is, wow. How many people can say their parents were willing to give up so much of their life for your own dream? It's amazing. And your dad was essentially like the first employee, the first head baker of the company. Baking around the clock. Yeah. And then don't get me wrong. I have spent many nights until four in the morning baking. I mean, I have some stories. If I started to break them down that you would be like, no way. I'm like, the the amount of um, hustle that we were putting into convincing people to purchase from us, like, I didn't even know how to break down the cost of anything. I was just, like, throwing out a number yeah. because I was trying to keep yeah. up. Yeah. Let me just look online. What are they selling for in New York City? Okay, yeah. that's our price. Yeah. Like, I literally... Sometimes that's, like, you don't have to think too hard. I mean... You should know your numbers, but sometimes it's just You that. definitely should, and I learned that the hard way, and I've had to adjust since. I'm clearly not as nice as I was when I began, but I also don't fault myself either because I think a lot of time, I think if I thought too hard about what I was doing, I would have freaked myself out and stopped. And and I also think if my parents were not like, keep going, keep going, yeah. I probably, I can count probably a million times I would have stopped if hmm. I did not have the amount of people surrounding this idea. There's no way I could have just flown with this. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's so impressive and such a like a bell ringing moment to think about. And Max, you told that story when we did the Tina's Vodka episode about uh, just walking up to the guy at the um, 
at the music venue to let you give you a gig and he's like who's you you know oh, but like yeah. the the chutzpah, the chutzpah we would the, the say, moxie. in Yiddish, the moxie the cojones like to just to just say yeah no i got this and and in youth you're so more willing to buy into those things so it's yeah. like we need to take a page out of our youthful selves or the youth need to be like you know that old think of like <laughs> oh if only I knew then what I know now. Like, okay, well, maybe you don't always have to know it, but you just have to have the conviction and go do it because so many good things. And for yeah. the older people to be like, no, I, I have to get back that chutzpah to go do these things. Yeah. Uh, not to take a complete left turn, but it's, I don't know, it kind of reminds me of this. Um, you mentioned it before, Matt, but uh, I finally finished watching Drops of God. Oh. Yeah, uh, uh, streaming on Apple TV, not well, a sponsor. The father daughter connection is is strong there. That in is Drops true. Of God and yeah, and, and the yeah. slice of pie. Are you familiar with the show at all? I'm not. So I'll it's, have to look into it. To oversimplify, it is uh, it's it's a wine show. It's a show uh, based in the wine uh, world. Did you know, Matt, that this was originally a graphic novel, a manga? I did. Like, There's like thirty books of it, yeah, or something like, like that. Yeah, huge installments. Um, the, the quick summary is just uh, a legendary wine collector who has the greatest wine collection in the world. I guess he would be at. the equivalent of like Robert Parker, essentially. Yeah. But if he w- existed in Japan and also taught a, m- a major amount of students and had yeah. the best collection in the world of wine, yeah. Mm-hmm. And in the in the graphic novels, in the ma- manga, am I saying it right? Manga? manga? I don't know. I don't know what the name of it is. That, is that no- style of graphic novel. It's Japanese, um, but. Uh, in in the books, uh, it's a Japanese collector. In the show, he's a French collector that like lived in the Chateau de Pop and uh, created this amazing um, book. It was kind of like you know, like if you had a Zagat's or or something, but for specifically for wine. And uh, well, it was it's like was, it's like uh, actually like who wine are gonna have spectator or something or. No, oh. more, it's more like a guide, like a Michelin guide, uh, but for wine or yeah. like the. Um, the Oxford, Kansas, exactly the Oxford Companion or like the Sotheby's book, yeah, yeah, we're, uh, Encyclopedia of Wine. Yes, yeah. If you guys are big into wine, and we're going to get deep into this conversation in a couple weeks <clears> uh, <throat> with some of the biggest and brightest brains in the wine industry. But anyhow, um, the show is really cool. It's about uh, lineage and all, kind of like succession and all that. Like, uh, who's going to take over this person's amazing collection when they pass? But he makes it a challenge for his daughter in the books it's actually his son and then he gets a random uh food rider or a wine rider to be the challenger Mm -hmm. and in this one it's his daughter and then there's a person that challenges and he says by the way the whole show is in english french and japanese simultaneously wow so it's a little tough if you're like you gotta do a lot of reading or you or you gotta know three languages but (laughs) you can get through it um it took a moment for me to like get into the groove of listening to it and watching it. And I'm like, okay, now I'm into it and I'm hooked. Um, really good show. Amazing. Like on the wine knowledge and it's a legit for any wine professional out who like sees some shows and they think like, Oh, this, this person like tangentially knows about wine. Yeah, Whoever yeah. wrote this show really knows their shit when it comes to wine. Yeah. Wow. There's like moments where they're asking like, kind of like not trivia, but like questions that you would need to know the theory of like wine and all that. What, what varietal is this? What grape, you know, whatever, all this stuff. And everything came out. I was like, Oh yeah. And you'd even, it got me a couple of times. Cause I'm like the retired Psalm. I don't, I don't keep up with things. And as they were saying things, I'm like, Oh, clearly it's this. And then I was wrong. I'm like, mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. But it, it's good to watch. Um, but it leads me to uh, think about a previous guest of the show way back. We had Eric Asimov. We did. Who is like, I mean, one we we the, could have used him as the example of of a guy. I don't know what Eric's uh, wine cellar looks like. I, I highly doubt it's as robust as the guy in the in the book or in the in the show. I don't show. think so. Journalism these days doesn't. He never created his own guide, unfortunately. But yes, he is like one of the top authorities on wine in this country. Yeah, the the New York Times uh, wine writer. Well, he did write an article recently, and I want to get your take, Matt. The title of it was "The Twilight of the American Sommelier," and he essentially laments that. Uh, aside from the ultra elite restaurants like a Le Bernardin or a French Laundry or something like that, uh, aside from them, which they still have amazing wine programs and their sommelier is quite effective and necessary, obviously, Mm -hmm. uh, that the American sommelier is kind of becoming a thing of the past and that it's not relevant to um, these like growing costs of, of restaurants and like, 
the, basically the first thing to go is the psalm because th- it's looked at like it's superfluous in the idea of running a r- traditional restaurant. And I would like to know your thoughts on this uh, on this article. Let me step up on my soapbox for a second. Just yeah. Give me a moment. No, um, you know, you're probably going to be surprised by my take. But first of all, this is no surprise. I mean, as a matter of fact, this has been happening for over 10 years and the pendulum also swings on this there was a time in the in the early or the late aughts like 07 08 2009 where yes and asmov relates to this in the the, article in the article yeah yeah. that you know every restaurant that was worth its salt had to have a sommelier and um i get it in the the i see the other side of that and that business-wise how do you legitimize how do you find that in the books to pay somebody to simply handle wine and so what what uh what happens is like you said they're the first to go and as we know the profit margins in restaurants maybe in making pie is not that high uh however i wish there was some middle ground um where now right. we have some yahoo uh and very often and, and especially when i got down here it was like oh the head waiter or one of our waiters handling the wine programs now sometimes though that person did know something or they they were passionate about it but it's like then it's just it comes to connecting the dots and i think at the very least we could have somebody that's super passionate about wine heading up these programs and at the very least in our own restaurants Hey, how about we pay for their wine education? Yeah. Because there's a WSET program. Um, uh, Doreen Collindress has um, yeah, the Vitus House, the Vitus House, which you can do your W set there or find, you know, pay for their uh, court, of, court of Master Sommelier's education, which will cost you some money, but not the same money that it would be. And so that this person, because even in the court now, they teach you actually how to manage a wine program. Yeah. So to, to sum up, I just think that I wish I get it how they're the the dying of the sommelier, but I wish we had a little bit more importance on it and uh, restaurant owners were able to provide at the very least education. And you could also be uh, take initiative and be innovative of how you can pay that person based on revenue, based on wine, a percentage of wine sales. This actually kind of reminds me of uh, uh, an old episode we did with a um, joke. Joe Kwan of the Avet Brothers. Oh yeah, uh, we had in Joe Kwan. I don't know if you listen to the Avet Brothers, but uh, they're fantastic. Mm-hmm. And Joe is the um, he's the cellist in the band. And he had said he's like, um, if I wanted to like merit me being in this band, I kind of had to diversify and do mm. some other things because solely <clears throat> being the cellist and and he he's not like writing the songs per se. I mean, maybe his his cell his cello parts, but not like the lyrics and the the sh- structure. He's like, I've got to do other things in the band to make myself relevant. So I uh, I do the bookings and I, I sometimes I cook online or uh, on tour and uh, I handle a lot of the logistics, kind of like mm-hmm. tour manager. Esque, and I don't know. Now they're like huge bands, so maybe they've got other people to do that. But in the early goings, that was kind of his thing. So that that parallel is that I think sommeliers need to kind of also be the general manager, or also be the chef, or also be something else yeah. in there. But I don't think the importance of um, having a sommelier should go away. I think that it's extremely important to like have that knowledge and understand because because that's how you can like. That's how you can differentiate, win. but that's how you can like win on a spreadsheet is with a great wine program. Like, yes. like having a guy like you, Matt, and I've always had a guy like you, it was actually him, uh, <laughs> be my sommelier, like in the, in the moments where I was the general manager of a restaurant and even how Matt and I first met, I was the, I called myself the wine director and I really didn't know what I was doing. And I hired Matt to replace me as the bartender. And then I looked at him like, uh, will you help me run this program? Uh, I have no idea what I'm doing. And then through that, like we learned together and, and kind of, then I, then I figured things out, you know, mm-hmm. but, but like it showed on the bottom line after a while that like, if you could find that diamond in the rough wine or you could find something that like, that was, it's like the purpose but of how the, about just the experience of having like a really well curated list. It doesn't have to be huge and having people who are coming there to drink great wine, have it mesh into the food and have somebody that can talk about it knowledgeably to understand your palate, the yeah. guest palate and how on un- understand how it's going to pair harmoniously with the food. Well, and a proper sommelier isn't just a wine nerd that knows all the all the thirteen varietals in a Chateau Neuf de Pop, they know how to make the dining experience pleasurable. Right, that's they like can, the Bobby can, Stuckies of the world. You know, he's right. 
So he wrote a response like yeah. post about how uh, they have taken the complete opposite turn and really leaned into their wine program. And we're talking about Bobby Stuckey, who is a master sommelier and the owner uh, of Fresca, Fresca in and three Boulder. other restaurants in Boulder too. I don't yeah. remember and their names. Scottapetta, the wine yeah. out of uh, Italy. Italy. Yeah. yeah, but um, but yeah, I think I think there's a lot of innovative ways, but I also think like you know, and then it becomes because you have to pay those people somehow to be on the floor to actually interact with the guests at same sometimes because no offense, but a lot of these people that are on the staff or the way they might like wine, they might think they like wine, but their knowledge is not where it, it should be for a restaurant who yeah. boasts to have a really impressive wine program. Yeah. I'm not sure what any of this has to do with pie, but, uh, <laughs> you know, pie, wine. You said you liked wine. Everything comes back to pie. So we can talk about anything. <laughs> well, and I like, this is also early goings and on things, but Matt and I have some plans, uh, hopefully <clears throat> before the end of this year, that we will start creating things like a scholarship for wine education uh, and a scholarship for uh, culinary education. Wow. It's important to us uh, for the podcast to uh, not just talk about it, but like to help drive it. And I think... Uh, when you're talking about the growth of a community, education is firmly mm -hmm. planted as that growth piece. And so if we want great restaurants, then we have to make great restaurant tours. And the the chef has to know things. The line cooks have to know things. The servers have to know things. And I think it, it does kind of start with that. And you got to learn Very from someone. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, coming soon and, uh, you know, we'll we'll figure that one out, but we'll we'll get it out there so that people that want to learn, hopefully, we can help be a resource to the community for that. And I'm not saying this to like promote us, but we uh, have a, a personal want to like help lift this food and beverage community up. It kind of does serve it for the purposes of our show, but it also like selfishly, we want to eat at great dope ass restaurants. Yeah. And we want to have great experiences with fantastic wine programs and. And and hospitality, and I think that's uh, it's all part of it. Yeah, and have the av availability and the knowledge to know where to go. Great, find a great slice of pie that is uh, <laughs> better than ever or different than everybody else. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually going to be opening up some classes to teach how to make. So, oh, for what you were just saying, yeah. like, okay. um, I've always wanted to teach classes, um, and. Uh, I'm probably saying this wrong, but I think it's like P1 tourism through Visit Raleigh. I'm probably saying it wrong. Um, Lauren Gold but, set me up with sure. um, an organization that's – we'll have it on our website soon. I'm going to start teaching classes. We'll see how it goes, but I've always thought like there's such a nostalgia, and most people have no idea how to bake a pie. Yeah. So um, – we're going to start setting up some classes to so stay tuned because that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to, as a Raleigh native too, like I have so many deep ties to this town and I've seen what's happened and where, where it was going and what's happened. And it's like super important to me to be a part of like the growth of what the potential of Raleigh and where it's leading towards. So like you trying to stay active and like have some purpose with all of that, I'm seeking that as well. Like it's very important yeah. to me to be very involved in what's happening with what's ha like everything that's going on with Raleigh and the growth. And, you know, I'm some people say, well, you're just like a small business here and I don't have all this, you know, um, these awards behind us from a national perspective. I'm like, well, actually, we kind of do. I've just kept my head in the business for so long. I need to start talking about it <laughs> yeah. more. Um, but we definitely want to make an impact as well. So starting with classes and some exciting things coming up. Yeah. Yeah, my uh, my wife is uh, now on the board of the Downtown Raleigh Alliance. So, so she's uh, aware, like there's this whole new um uh, proposition, not proposition, but it's a it's a it's a plan to build downtown uh, properly. And I need to, to speak with her, boost it up. So, <laughs> yeah, for those that need to like like chime in, I think like right now is the best time to speak up. And I know Matt's always got an opinion about things in downtown. And, we like uh, opinionated people. Yeah. yeah, well, that's how you start growing, yeah. and make a change. You know, um, so so yeah, so a lot of fun things to look forward to. But specifically as it pertains to the Slice Pie Company, for one. Pie Day is coming. That is yes. March 14th. So put that in your calendar. Get yourself some pie. Um, Matt, what do you got? Well, uh, before we get out of here, I just want to know, what is your, do you have a go-to pie if you're eating pie or your favorite pie to, to make? 
Well, it's one of the most controversial words you could ever say in your life, apparently, are pecan pie. Oh, okay. Mm, so yeah. you either say pecan <laughs> or, or you pecan. say pecan, and yeah. I've gotten yeah. heated discussions with people over this. But my go-to all year, like, I will always go for my pecan pie. Pecan pie. Yeah. Okay. You and say pecan, ships, I say pecan. I know. And I it grew up saying pecan, but I'm from California. I know. I know. And I don't judge, but people get real judgy about that word. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I stick with, I mean, could you imagine me with my accent, though, saying pecan? Pecan. Yeah. yeah. I'm such a pecan girl. Yeah. And so. is it, well, that reminds me because you you guys said gala. You said gala. gala. And some people say gala. Yeah. Gala. What is it? Is gala. it gala? gala? Well, it's gala? whatever you I want it gala. to be, just like pecan or pecan. Or potato, potato, tomato, <laughs> yeah. tomato. Who cares? Yeah. Let's call the whole thing off. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> Matt, what do you call the clothing that you wear to go to bed? Pajamas. I say pajamas. Yeah. You say pajamas. Pajamas. Some people say, I say pajamas. Or I'll say jammies to my daughter. But yeah. Um, let's yeah. all call PJs, everybody. Yeah. I mean, let's, uh, <laughs> right? Harmony. PJs. Right? Yeah. Either way, we can all meet and agree agree on pie. Thank you so much, Kristen, for Thank coming you. in, for bringing these pies. I am very much looking forward to uh, enjoying them. And I will tell everybody else, if you want to uh, get yourself a great slice of pie, go to the Slice Pie Company and you will eat extremely merrily. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the NC F&B Podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged.